Um, I am the prevention services coordinator. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. So if you would like to talk about me in the third person, you can do that um, using those pronouns specifically. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today is LGBTQ relationships and protective factors in a positive aspect rather than a negative aspect. So still waiting on the slides, but the shelter for help and emergency were located in planning district 10 in Charlottesville, Virginia. And so we serve the areas of Charlottesville, Fluvanna, Louisa, Green, and Nelson counties, as well as Albemarle County and Charlottesville city. But um, I'm happy to be here today because I actually uh, was part of this consent summit last year and it was really amazing. And I really appreciate being able to see all the um, other lovely presentations by lovely individuals and all the cool information that they're sharing as well. As well. still not able to share my screen right now. Technology is the best. <laughs> So in the interest of time and just being um, conscious of time and making sure we get through everything, I'm going to switch around what I was going to do a little bit because when I do presentations, I always like to have questions um, that I ask for people's perspective in the chat. So we can start with one of those first. And then once the slides come up, we can just bounce around through that way. So my question for you all is, has anybody in this space ever heard of LGBTQ folks mentioned either in sexual or domestic violence spaces before? And if so, what was said about the LGBTQ plus community? One second. And if you have an answer, please just um, go ahead and drop it in the chat or turn your screen on and you can go ahead and answer the question. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so I see Leslie says we offer DV support groups for LGBTQ survivors. It's a common misconception that they don't experience DV. Yes, so especially if you're talking about, oh, I have women in shelter, right? But you're not including um, people who don't identify as women who may be part of the LGBTQ community. And also if you refer to all survivors as women and then all perpetrators as men, you're assuming that there's um, a very particular relationship dynamic there, right? Okay. Yay, slides, okay. Um, I see other people have also said that people in the LGBTQ community, especially those who have other marginalizations, experience it at greater rates than people that are not in the LGBTQ community. Yes, that's very true. And we will be hitting on um, why phrasing that particular way um, can be kind of interesting. Um, it isn't common um, for some people in this group haven't worked with uh, people who identified as LGBTQ+, maybe they're less likely to report or they feel left out. And that it also exists, um, but rarely going into details. So a lot of what it seems like people have heard is that, yes, there are people who experience DV in the LGBTQ community, but it doesn't really go much deeper than that. And when it does go deeper, it's more thinking about how there is higher prevalence, right? And that's something very particular about that, which is that when we're thinking about there's a higher rate or higher prevalence, we're seeing a particular group and they're being LGBTQ plus or another um, marginalized population. We're attaching that to some negativity, 
right? And if we're not really thinking about that, it's not being LGBTQ plus that puts you at a higher risk. It's existing in a homophobic and transphobic society that puts us at a higher risk. So just because I have the slides up now, I'm going to go through a couple of them, kind of bouncing around. So I apologize for the uh, inconsistent flow of this, but we're just going to keep it going regardless. So again, this is my contact information. Um, if you'd like to get a hold of me to talk more deeply about these topics or to ask questions or anything else, um, you can reach out through any of these forms of communication. And I will put these back in again at the end. Um, I also see somebody in the chat posted about black transgender women who experience an epidemic um, of all types of violence, but have a lower mortality rate from domestic violence. So we see that with black transgender women, they are usually marginalized in that intersection of anti blackness and trans misogyny where specifically violence against transgender women. So a lot of different intersections are going on there. So that's kind of goes into my next couple of slides where when we're thinking about what does the LGBTQ community encompass, it can encompass romantic orientation, sexual orientation, and gender. So with romantic orientation, we also want to think about how in a lot of our healthy relationship programming and sexual violence prevention work, we may not be inclusive of people who do not experience sexual attraction or romantic attraction at all, but still want to have healthy romantic and or sexual relationships or healthy friendships and familial relationships that don't include a sexual or romantic component. We also need to be inclusive of different genders. So like I said at the beginning of this presentation, if we assume that everyone who experiences sexual violence is a woman or a specifically a cisgender woman, we are locking out a lot of other people who need those resources and need that support. So when we're thinking about gender, we want to be inclusive of those who do not align with a sex that was assigned to them at birth and people who don't fall within a gender binary, which assumes that men and women are not only the only two options you have, but they are inherently opposite to each other and complementary. So what one lacks, the other has. We also want to remind ourselves that LGBTQ plus folk often have multiple marginalizations like people in the chat have mentioned. So not all LGBTQ folks are automatically white, cisgender, fit easily into the expectations of having male or female anatomy, which is especially important when thinking about sexual health, right? Many LGBTQ plus folk have disabilities. Not all of us are thin. We're not all citizens or documented. We don't all have a religion. And if we do have religion, not all of us are Christian. And not all of us are in monogamous relationships or want a monogamous relationship. So it's important to remember that like everybody, we are a constellation of experiences and identities, which is something that can often get lost when talking about the LGBTQ plus community as a whole. So we did these questions, right? I really appreciate your engagement and you can please feel free to keep posting in the chat if you have questions or comments or thoughts along the way. I love seeing other people's perspectives when I'm doing this type of stuff. And another question that I have for you is if you are LGBTQ+, have you ever had violence prevention programming that was specific to your experience? Or if maybe you're a parent or a family member of someone who's LGBTQ+, do you think have they ever received prevention programming that was specific to them as an LGBTQ person? Okay, so seeing a lot of people being like, no, not something that we got. I know it's totally shocking because schools are super amazing about sexual health and prevention programming in general. So this is totally shocking to me. It's not, that was sarcasm. So a lot of times we see that LGBTQ youth are being left out of prevention programming as well as direct services. So it's not just that I can't go to a local uh, rape crisis center or domestic violence organization and feel like they're going to approve or appreciate my experience. It may also just be even if I have never experienced an unhealthy relationship, but I want to know how to have a healthy relationship. Everything presented to me is still not in a framework that I can access. 
But we also see when it is mentioned and when places do say that they're being inclusive, a lot of times it's focusing on those negatives, on how traumatic it is to be LGBTQ+, how you're going to experience a lot of homophobia and transphobia, and almost making, again, that connection between because you are LGBTQ, you're doomed, in a sense, to have very unhealthy relationships. So I really want everyone who's participating in this to really hold these statements in your heart. That LGBTQ plus communities are not just at risk or underserved or underinformed or whatever other buzzword you're using populations. And we do have strengths that we can be draw that we can draw from and that the whole community can draw from as well that can promote healthy relationships. And we're gonna go over some of these strengths today. So the first one on here is the idea of a found family. So this is a concept that for many LGBTQ youth or individuals in general, their family may not have been a safe place where they could fully realize their identity. So it might be that your family was very, had very high expectations that you would grow up and marry someone of another gender, right? And that you would be in a stereotypically heteronormative relationship, marriage, family, whatever it is. They also may have been a lot of expectations about your gender, whether that's how you present to other people, uh, how your body experiences, what your body image is like, or the way that you move about in the world. So when our families are not affirming of us and we see that there's a lot of overlaps between LGBTQ plus experience and people who may have experienced sexual trauma or intimate partner violence, if we feel like we are not being fully affirmed by our family, we may need to seek that support out in other people who've had similar experiences. So connecting with people who want to understand us instead of saying, I expect you to be like this. And if you're not like this, then there is some punishment or a lack of access. And knowing that healthy boundaries can only be set with somebody who sees me as a human being and sees me as a person and understands that I have the right to make my own decisions, right? So this is a really important thing that we can take into creating healthy relationships is it's not about a blood relation so much as who do I want to build community with? Who do I feel connected and supported by? And sometimes that isn't your family member. Sometimes your direct family members are not open to supporting you in the way that you need. And that's okay. You're allowed to build a family outside of those blood relations. Is anything coming up for people when they look at the slide or start thinking about this? Ballroom culture. Ooh, could you speak to a little bit for that people who might not be familiar with what ballroom culture is? So ballroom culture in my eyes is honestly the source of a lot of what we call pop culture from our lingo to style. Um, and going back to what you said, especially in um, marginalized communities where we're pushed out of having the resources that we deserve um, ball culture is basically, um, again, like a source for people, specifically LGBTQ people to like come together and congregate and to celebrate just being themselves. And that's beautiful. Yes, love to see it. We also know that ball culture originated in a lot of um, lower income in Black and Latinx and in um, communities with sex workers where they were not considered acceptable enough to be in the typical uh, spaces. So they created their own spaces and their own forms of community and joy. Another aspect that I really want to touch on is the idea of fluidity. So thinking back to, let's say you are a asexual person. So you do not experience sexual attraction. Maybe you're not interested in any kind of sexual relationship. So that might butt up against a lot of what our culture has told us a successful romantic relationship looks like, right? So really expanding our idea of if sex is not something that I need or that I want in order to be loved or to feel loved by someone else, what do I need to feel loved and supported, right? So changing our idea of what is a caring and affirming relationship look like if we're not sticking to these norms. 
Another thing that we go into is what does sex look like? So thinking a lot about sexual health, a lot of that assumes that we have a person with a penis and a person with a vagina having penetrative sex. And you can have the particular anatomical situation and be LGBTQ, totally possible. But there's also a lot of other situations where you're not going to have that particular combination or that particular type of sex. So thinking, how do we make sure people know the whole spectrum of sexual health? What does sex even mean or look like for a lot of people, right? For two people who have vaginas and aren't interested in penetrative sex, how do we talk about consent and sexual health for a relationship that looks like that? And then also, what does it mean to be a girl, a boy, a non-binary person, a person without a gender? What does it mean for somebody to actually shift and explore what it is that they want out of how other people see them and how people in their relationship might see them, right? So our society often tells us very prescriptively, this is what you do in order to have this or be this or look like this. But with the LGBTQ plus community, I have seen a lot of emphasis on exploring yourself, on trying new things. And if something doesn't serve you, then it's okay to let that go and to see what there is out there and how many options you have. So is there anything coming up for people when they look at this slide or thinking about this topic? You can either unmute or you can post in the chat, whatever works for you. Ooh, authenticity as a strength, yes. So being who I am because it's who I am and not because it's who someone else wants me to be. That translates really nicely into healthy relationships. Anything else? It looks very genuine, which I appreciate because I feel like going back to what you were saying about heteronormative just behaviors and that's what we see in society. It, fluid, fluidity is so beautiful to see because it looks like people are genuinely in love with one another. I just want to show and express that love. Yes, I choose to love this person because I choose it, not because I have to. And for those who might not know what heteronormativity is, it's the idea that being heterosexual, right, a person being in love with the opposite gender or opposite sex category is what's normal and expected and anything else is an other. Um, I see somebody also said in the chat, boundaries and consent become more explicit because they're not assumed to match the dominant paradigm. Yes, yeah, so if I can't just assume everyone likes these things or everybody's into this stuff, I have to have an actual conversation about what those boundaries actually are for the individual person that I'm dating or trying to be in relationship with. Yes. So this kind of goes into what Leslie was saying with authenticity as a strength. So freedom from prescriptive gender roles. So our actions in a relationship should feel right and authentic to us instead of saying, because I'm a woman, I have to do these things, right? If you're a non-binary person, the prescriptive gender roles are pretty meaningless to you. And for some people that's scary to say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or who I'm supposed to be but in another way, it can be very freeing, right? Sometimes losing these boundaries can feel really anxiety inducing if we're so used to being what we think other people want from us, but binaries will never save us or offer us any kind of liberation. Having options and choices and then making those that feel really authentic to us is what will save us from all different types of trauma. So is anything coming up for people looking at this slide? And if we need maybe some more idea on what that means with a gender role, let's say that I am a bisexual person. I am, but let's say like I'm a different bisexual person and I'm in a relationship with a cisgender man, right? Because I'm a bisexual person, my experiences with attraction and with what roles I play in a relationship, like who's supposed to have and birth the children, right? Who's supposed to work and who's supposed to stay home and take care of children, 
right? If we decide to get married and have a wedding, am I supposed to wear a dress? Am I supposed to wear lipstick and shave my legs because that's how a woman is, does a relationship with a man, right? But being a bisexual person, if I've had relationships where those things were not assumed and they didn't feel they were required, then perhaps I feel that's not something I want to carry into my relationship, even though it might be read to other people as though it is straight, right? So having that freedom from the, because you fit in this box, this is what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to act. So if people have any thoughts on this, or is it okay for me to go to the next slide? I actually wanted to say I love how you express binaries will not save us because binaries don't even help the demographic it serves, which is heteronormative people. And it's just like gender roles even hurt um, heteronormative, anyone who assimilates to that. So it's like, who does it really serve? Choices is what we need. Yeah, because it's totally fine if you're a woman in a relationship with a man and you're like, I want to shave my legs, but you should never feel like you have to because that is what you owe to the world, right, in order to affirm yourself. Yes. Um, I see someone says, I'm thinking that everything we learn is based on the binary, even if I'm a gender creative person, constantly questioning what standards and norms I'm defying by just being myself. Yeah, so your existence can in and of itself define binaries and that is wonderful, right? And it can be hard to unpack all the ways we've been taught that there are specific ways we have to be in our society. That can be a real struggle, especially since it's literally everywhere. But being yourself and doing things because you choose them and not because other people want you to be that way is a really great tool to take when we're thinking about healthy friendships and healthy relationships with anybody. This is another really big protective factor because this is a lot of what I've seen people when thinking about unhealthy relationships and abusive relationships, a lot of people will bring up a lack of self-esteem, a feeling of not being worthy and not being of deserving. So I think having a sense of self-knowledge and a sense of respect for yourself can be very protective and encouraging towards having healthy relationships. So when I say self-knowledge, what that means to me is the idea of I might not know everything about myself. I might maybe still be figuring out labels or how I present or how I want other people to speak to me, but it's at least the knowledge that I have some idea of where these boundaries are. Maybe I don't know everything, but I know this is a boundary I'm comfortable with. I know that I like these pronouns that they make me feel good about myself. I know that being called this nickname feels really good to me, right? So one of these concepts on this slide is also discussing gender euphoria, right? So this might be a new concept for people, but some people may be familiar with the idea of gender dysphoria. So when a lot of people have conversations about the transgender or non-binary community, it can be hard to think of how do I describe how somebody existing in a body or a category that they have. A lot of times we assume transgender people always feel a discomfort or a dislike for the body that they're existing in. Whereas gender euphoria is less about the negative, right? What I don't like, what's uncomfortable to me, and more about what it is comfortable, what brings me joy. Right, so maybe what would bring me joy would be getting some kind of surgery to um, remove my breasts, right? That's just an example. That's not something specific to me. That's just a general example, right? So a person might say, this is what's going to make me feel more like myself is modifying my body in this way. For someone else, they might be like, I'm totally good with my body, but what makes me feel better about myself is somebody calling me their boyfriend or their partner, but never calling me their girlfriend, right? So again, focusing on that, what it is that makes me feel good, makes me feel joy, makes me feel affirmed. And some people question, how can you have one, gender euphoria without dysphoria? But as a famous non-binary writer, Andy Connor once said, a card can be pulled without being pushed. So you don't necessarily have to have some type of discomfort to know what things make you feel good. And that can be difficult for people who've experienced relationship trauma, sexual trauma, 
right? Thinking, well, I don't even know what's going to feel good to me. I only know what I've experienced that felt bad. But actually sitting down with yourself and really processing even the really nitty gritty bits, right? I really like when somebody texts me in the morning and says good night to me at night, even if we can't text throughout the rest of the day or we can't see each other in person anymore because of COVID, right? That's a good thing. That gives you some sense of euphoria, some sense of joy. So you can carry this beyond just gender into your whole self. Is this slide bringing anything up for people or anything they'd like to comment on or questions? I see Austin says, gender euphoria reminds me of Kevin Garcia's concept of treating your body like it's your soul's partner as opposed to yourself. Instead of judging it, you would support it like you would a partner. I love that because we're so used to being told that you have to give to other people and pour into other people to show them that you support them. It's hard to do that for yourself. So I like that because it kind of brings it into self-care a little bit, right? I'm going to treat my body like it's my soul's partner instead of me and who I am. I can still support it even if I don't like everything about it. Anything else that people want to share about this slide or can I continue on? And then something that I really want to hit on because I think it's very important. Sorry, was, did somebody have their mic off because they want to share? I just hear the like random distinct squeaky sounds of someone's mic going, but all right. Um, this is the last slide I have for these particular types of strengths before we shift to something else. But connection to history and culture is a very important part of being a member of the LGBTQ community. So this isn't just knowing the history of the movement, right? It's not just knowing that most of what we had was given to us by those who were Black, Latinx, Indigenous, gender nonconforming, transgender women a lot of people who end up getting shut out of the community, right? Butch lesbians, trans men, a lot of people who aren't considered to fit. But also understanding that prior to colonialization, many, many cultures did not have a strict gender binary system. The idea that because your body looks a certain way or you were born with certain parts and pieces means you have to fit these roles and that you have to act in this particular way or present this particular way didn't really exist in societies that did not have white supremacy as a huge part of them, right? So in understanding that, in understanding that lack of choice comes from white supremacy, we connect LGBTQ plus communities with many other communities that have been violated by colonialization. And for a lot of LGBTQ plus people of color, engaging with the roots of their historical uh, race, their nationality, their ethnicity, oftentimes means reconnecting with the origins of what gender, what sex, what relationships looked like in those communities originally. And LGBTQ plus people within those communities and their accomplishments being erased from history looks a lot like how we have erased the long history of sexual violence and domestic violence and intimate partner violence in all communities, right? Acting like because people watch certain music videos or have access to the internet is why rates of sexual violence are so high. It has nothing to do with that, right? It has to do with the systems of oppression. So rejecting the gender binary for some people is reclaiming their culture as well. It's not just an individual piece of healing. It can also be generational and a cultural form of healing. Um, I see that Liza mentioned Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Riera, Rivera, sorry. Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera were two very important transgender women. Marsha P. Johnson was a black transgender woman and Sylvia Rivera was a, Latin, a Latina transgender woman. And they were pioneers of the, what's known as the Stonewall Uprising. And 
just in general in their community, they did so much to protect and provide for other transgender women, for butch lesbians. Um, Stormy, I'm probably gonna butcher the last name, so I will just write it in the chat because, yeah, was another one, right? Another member of that community. A lot of the civil rights and the legal rights that we have today is because the people who are on the fringes of the community who are not who are seen as the other and not able to assimilate into heteronormativity into whiteness into um, able bodied cultures right who are just way too far on the fringes actually did most of the work that brought us into the forefront of the LGBTQ civil rights movements right. But there's still a lot of work to be done because rates are still so high for violence for so many people in the community. And we're still talked about as though we're just inherently more likely to be harmed without really thinking about what there is that causes that. And also what we can bring to the table to create healthy communities, healthy friendships, healthy relationships. Is anything else coming up for people, questions or comments when they think about this slide? So have you seen any examples of these, whether it's feeling authentic, whether it's fluidity, connection to history or culture, have you seen any of these before, whether that's in your friendships, your relationships, organizations, and how have you seen them lead to healing or healthy relationships? I would say representation is a good example um, for, I know like, I know it's just a show, but Pose is really beautiful because it kind of gets to represent what LGBTQ looks like and like how ballroom culture is like prevalent, not just now, like it's not something that's just trendy now, but it's something that's been a culture for a long time. Yes, Pose is a great show to use as an example because they really have a great found family center where the whole main cast knows each other from connecting through the ball culture, but the ones that are part of the one family, the one house, they're all, they were all kicked out of their homes or in some ways rejected by their families, so they created their own, and that's so beautiful, and we root for them all, even though we know that they're even though they're based on real life people, that they're not real. Um, but representation's a really good example. So if you have examples from TV shows or books or movies, that can is also a good time to bring up. Thank you for the uh, time reminder. So where else have you seen examples of Love at First Night? Yes, yeah, so Love at First Night is a web series, if people are not familiar about it. Um, it focuses on two black gay men and they tell the story of how they met and fell in love. So there are a lot of interesting um, places that it goes, but specifically in the first season, there is a plot line where one of the men, uh, Spencer, looks in, is looking in Jaden's bathroom cabinet and he sees that Jaden has pill bottles. And of course, his automatic assumption is, could he be HIV positive? Does he have a mental health issue? What's going on? And he confronts him in a way that is very open, open questions, very non-judgmental and giving him the space to share as much as he likes and um, just have a more healthy communication instead of what we might see on a lot of other shows, which is the big dramatic fight and accusation, right? So I always think about that. So that's a good example. Uh, Schitt's Creek is also a good example where we see a relationship that's very um, equal between the two characters. Again, a pansexual man and a gay man who are very open um, with their emotions. Clearly, there's a lot of sense of safety between them. Sense8, 
I love Sense8. Um, that's a really good example of that fluidity, right? Where a lot of the characters connect through some kind of mind link. Some of the characters are gay, lesbian, transgender, and some of them are not. But through their almost inherent ability to identify with each other and become each other, there's a lot of fluidity that opens their relationship and sense of family. Moonlight is also a beautiful film. Um, the relationship in Moonlight is very subtle, but I think that sense of self and identity and knowing who you are um, really comes through. It's a beautiful film about a young black man. It follows him through childhood all the way through adulthood um, and sees his different relationships. Um, but with one of his classmates, Kevin, um, who is his, the only man that he's ever really known and loved, uh, which is beautiful. Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. I don't know that one, so could you speak on that? Because I've actually, that's like one of the only ones people have said that I haven't seen any of. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's like a CW show, uh, mainly for teenagers, and it represents um, trans people. It represents um, one of the main characters is a bisexual Black man. Um, hmm. They, oh, because it's a show about like witchy stuff and stuff like that. A lot of like shows like that, that like showcase around witches are always about like woman empowerment and stuff like that. Um, and because it's again, like a spiritual, like witchy thing, they have different, they, there's a point where they even like showcase different um, spiritualities and different cultures and stuff like that. So that's cool too. Yeah. Yeah, so being intersectional right? And representation is a really good thing because a lot of people don't even realize these, that being gay, queer, being trans, any of it is possible until they see someone else living that life authentically, especially if they grow up in an area where you don't talk about it. It's very hush-hush. You are not encouraged not to explore yourself or to explore anything about um, anything that is the other, right? So representation is really good. Can anybody think of how these things, oh, I see somebody also mentioned sex education and atypical are fun for teen representations, right? So not just seeing adults or people in their like early to mid twenties who identify as queer, trans, whatever it is, but also seeing people who are younger, right? Might be more relatable to teens in that way. Um, there's a book, I don't think it's super well known, but Full Disclosure by Cameron Garrett centers a black bisexual HIV, HIV positive teen and showcases really positive relationships with her and her peers and her family, most are, of whom are also part of the LGBT community. Yeah, so also not just having that one token character who also doesn't know any other queer trans LGBTQ plus people, right? Um, I also like that we're sharing things that maybe aren't super well known because that's helpful, right? It helps to have all these options, all these choices so that people don't have to just focus on, well, every book I know is about a white gay boy. If that's not my experience, but that's all there is, I'll take it. But I want a lot more options that are more authentic to me. Euphoria. Yes, I actually haven't seen that one either, um, but I believe that one goes a lot into mental health and substance dependence as well. Uh, I believe the main character is, I'm not sure if she is, if they have a specific label for her experience, but I know that her main relationship in the show is with a transgender woman. Also not familiar with Juliet Takes a Breath, but I love it and I will be writing some of these down. <laughs> Grand Army. Okay, Juliet Takes a Breath is a book. No, it's okay. If anybody would like to hop on and explain what some of these things are, we do, we have time for that. If you want to talk about Juliet Takes a Breath, Grand Army, anything else that I'm not familiar with. But no pressure not to if you don't feel like it. I know some people are zoomed out right now. And I don't say this with judgment. I say this just to draw awareness that a lot of what we're saying are media representations, right? It's hard to think of the, take this question and think of it in terms of real life, right? Maybe it's because we don't have a very large community of people who fit this community. 
or maybe it's because we're not used to thinking about and talking with members of this community in a way that's actually positive and not just focusing on the trauma that we've experienced. So something I've seen from my experience is when I first got involved with sexual violence advocacy, it was as part of a student group at my local college. I went to James Madison University. And while the group was specific to sexual violence, the majority of leadership were members of the LGBTQ community. And that was actually a very healing and affirming process for me to be a part of because we could have these very expansive conversations about what sexual violence looked like, how to be inclusive of different types of survivors, different types of healing that were open to people. Right? For some people, they actually could heal from parts of their sexual violence experience through dressing in a way that made them feel more euphoric, right? With engaging with other people who affirmed their identity instead of telling them they had to be in certain relationships or have sex in a certain type of way that wasn't consensual solely because that was the heteronormative expectation, right? So that's a real life example of how I have seen it lead to healing. And then I also, um, I'm going to skip ahead and then go back to the slide. I also asked some friends way back in 2019, which doesn't feel like it was two years ago, but it was, oh my gosh. I once asked them in a Facebook post, we talk so often about the bad parts of it, but what are the best parts about being LGBTQ plus? And I wanted to share some of the things that they said with you. So I, they said, having a rich, complex, ever-evolving perspective about relationships and boundaries that is not informed by patriarchy, doesn't adhere to regressive cultural norms and scripts that the, the straights are constantly trying to navigate. Um, accepting my identity and transitioning caused me to enjoy taking selfies, showing off how I look, being more positive about myself. Community, I had to fight for it, but it's been worth it. Finding a queer chosen family figuring out if a person's worth cultivating a relationship with or not. So if they are accepting and affirming of you, then you know you can have a deeper relationship with that person. Feeling more free to express yourself creatively in ways that you didn't before, ways that may have violated the norms for gender enforced on them at birth, and ways that uplift their femness or safic. Uh, femme is a feeling of femininity, and safic is the connection to um, women who are interested in romantic and or sexual relationships with women, right, or feminine people. Talking openly about mental health and being affirmed for it. Meeting supportive, loving, and passionate individuals in the community. Making it very easy to weed out bad partners um, simply by telling them that you're LGBTQ+. And then this is a very long comment, so I just highlighted part of it, but being able to hang out with a bunch of friends and being able to like just express yourself in a way that other people understand, not being ashamed of your feelings and being proud of them, mad love and care in the air because we had to fight for it, unapologetic love and an unspoken promise to look out for one another. So these are giving you guys like happy joy feelings. They always give me happy joy feelings to look at this. So I hope it's doing the same for you. And then now I'm just going to go back to this slide to kind of give us some sense of where maybe we can take this in the future. So some ways that you can encourage these strengths in your LGBTQ community, whether that's people that you work with, whether that's your friends or your family, your children, anybody that you're engaging with, is supporting spaces that are specifically for LGBTQ plus people deconstructing ideas of gender, sex, and relationships. So really thinking about why do I make this choice? Why are you making this choice? Is it because you feel like you have to? Are you feeling like it's not really a choice at all? If it's not serving you, you can let that go. Encouraging an exploration of self outside of relationships. So not just encouraging someone if they think that, if they're questioning their sexuality, not just encouraging them to date a whatever girl, boy, non-binary person and see what happens, right? We don't necessarily have to be in a relationship or try something to figure out parts of it and make sense of it, right? Especially right now with COVID, please, please do not be going out and engaging with people when you don't have to uh, and possibly spreading COVID. 
sharing positive and expansive media portrayals, like you all mentioned with Pose, Juliet Takes a Breath, Sunset, Grand Army, Euphoria, Atypical, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Moonlight, Schitt's Creek, Love at First Night. Sharing resources that are made by and for LGBTQ plus people and then breaking some binaries. And I'm not saying that the LGBTQ plus community is perfect and that we don't have binaries. I have seen some binaries myself, which are very frustrating and annoying. So if you're also a member of this community, doing that intra-community work as well, because binaries will not save us. Trying to be as acceptable and as palatable to cisgender and heterosexual people will not save us. It didn't save people in the past and it won't save us now. So we also have to do, sorry, does somebody have a thought? You can go ahead. I heard the mic again. Okay. Okay. So again, if we're part of this community, we have work to do as well. Are there any other thoughts or questions that people have about this slide, about the presentation? What are binaries? Good question. So a binary is the idea that there are only two options, right? Binary, bi, can mean two. So it's as if we are given two boxes and you're either in one or you're the other. You're either a girl or a boy. Your only choices are good or bad, girl or boy. Um, what other binaries? A lot of times we see the idea that somebody's either smart or not smart, right? And in these boxes, we have these lines drawn of what that means, right? What does it mean to be a girl? It means you have a vagina, that you like pink, that you are this and that you are that, but there's always gonna be people who don't fit in the box. So with binaries, it also says these two boxes are opposite, that they have nothing in common, and that whatever one has, the other lacks. So instead of saying, we only have these two places you can fit, we include everything that could go in those boxes and say, these are your options. You can pick and choose any, as many of them as you like, but you don't have to fit in one particular space. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Kaylee says, what if you're not part of this community? What can I do to be a better ally? You can also do all of the things on this slide, right? You can support LGBTQ plus spaces. Maybe that means that you're not sitting there in the support group, right? but maybe it means that you are like, hey, I'll donate pizza for one of these meetings. Or I know that this group needs a safe place to meet, so I will work with a community partner to find a space for them, right? Maybe it means talking with your kids about how some people's bodies look like this and they're not comfortable with that. So sometimes they do things to change their bodies so they can be more comfortable, right? Very age appropriate way to discuss being transgender and having gender dysphoria, right? Sharing examples of media that are expansive, that have a lot of different types of queer people, LGBTQ people, that they're not just all white, cisgender, gay or lesbian young people, right? Making sure we have a lot of variety and sharing those resources. So you can do all those same things on this slide as an ally that you can as a member of the community. Yeah. No problem. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, concerns? Well, thank you all for having me. I hope that this at least um, gave you something to think about or uh, was helpful in some way. Thank you so much for being here with us today and giving us so much knowledge. Yeah. And if anyone wants to keep in touch with Alex Weatherby, we will have the information in the chat. I'll, um, resend it again. So thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanna tell us before we have to depart?
Um, just thank you so much for holding this event. Uh, I've been seeing so many people just push things off or cancel them because of uh, COVID and everything else going on. So I really appreciate that you all still found a way to hold this and that you had such a cool lineup of diverse presentations. It's, I listened to the other two today and they were really awesome. And I'm excited to see what else goes on over the weekend. Thank you so much for being a part of this with us. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we are going to get started very, very soon, but we want to let everybody know um, that you can um, now please take a quick break. We'll start right back at three o'clock. And we look forward to um, seeing you back here at three. So go stretch your legs and we'll be right back. How you doing, Z? I'm doing pretty good, you know. Connection was pretty messy, but I'm excited to be here. Great, can you tell everybody uh, who you are and um, how you got involved with the Safe Bay Planning Committee? So, hey everyone, my name is Zaya, but you could call me Z for short. Um, how I got a part of the Planning Committee for Safe Bay? Well, I'm a part of Teens Pact, and Teens Pact, you're gonna see them this weekend. And they had sent me a nice text, a nice you know, message saying, hey, would you like to be a part of Safe Bay? And they gave me a brief synopsis of what Safe Bay is and me being a part of um, organizations on my campus. I go to SUNY Oswego. I do a lot of advocacy around educating about consent and striving for kids to you know learn about consent at an early age because I feel like consent is one of those things that you don't need to wait till a specific time to teach someone about consent so I found out about Safe Bay and what they do I found out about this lovely summit and I was like I'm for it I want to be a part of this planning committee and I've enjoyed every bit of planning and just seeing the production of this being made. And I can't wait to see next year's summit, the year after that. And also like Alex mentioned, this is very great that Safe Bay is having this summit despite the fact that you know we're in a pandemic and COVID and a lot of organizations have canceled their events because of COVID. But Safe Bay has shown that there is plenty of ways in which you can still discuss consents and many other things virtually. Hi, everybody. I wanted to take a minute. Um, I'm Shale Norris. I'm the executive director of Safe Bay. And I wanted to, I've been putting it in the chat, but wanted to share everyone with everyone um, the opportunity to um, join our crowdfunding for our consent panties. Um, it's going on for about, I think, another 15 days or so um, that we're working to get backers. So I'll put a link to this in the chat. Um, but um, the other, I know that there's a promo today um, for um, anybody from the summit who um, registers, there's also, uh, or um, backs the projects. There's also um, stickers available for anybody from the summit who um, backs the project today, they will also get free stickers. So I just wanted to flag everybody that that's happening and I will go ahead and stop my screen share, but then put that right in the link if anybody's interested.
So, hey, y'all, we got a couple more minutes till the next workshop, next, you know, slide presentation. I yeah. hope you have 